I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about JavaScript multi-touch gestures, browser UI logic, SVG animation, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we have a project called interact.js. This actually might be pronounced interdeltact.js. I am not 100% sure. Who can really say? Who, who, who's to say? Anyway, this is a really cool JavaScript library that supports drag and drop resizing and multi-touch gestures with inertia and snapping for modern browsers and IE8 and above. I know that because it says it on the web page. So let's go ahead and just look at some of these examples. Here is a simple example of dragging and dropping. You'll notice that I am dragging this element. And then, hey, look, it moved a distance of 196 pixels. And this time, it moved 155 pixels. Now, you'll notice on the left side right here, we have interact, the interact function. Uh, we have what we want to call it on, and then the particular action that we want. And then we get callbacks for different parts of the process. Uh, on here, we have the on move callback, which is going to be called every time the object is dragged and moved. And the on end, which is going to be when the item has stopped being dragged or ended. Now, you can also have inertia or, and even have some restrictions. Now, the restrictions are in effect right here. You look at this object right here. And as I'm dragging it, you'll notice that nothing is happening. I can drop it, but well, whatever. It just kind of stays within this outer element. Now, this one, when I drag this element, you'll see that these items highlight to denote that I can drop the element inside one of these drop zones or not at all. Now, if I drop it inside the drop zone, the text changes to dropped, dragged in and dropped. And then you can see we now have different events available for that particular example. And we can add to the list of classes and change the text content, just a ton of different things. Now, uh, this can be constrained to snapping on a grid. And we can even resize elements from the bottom left on this particular example. Now, I can't show these uh, with multi-touch rotation and gesture pinch to zooms, but they are supported on devices that support these, such as your cellular telephone or tablet. You can also use it in SVG files. Anyway, uh, this is a great plugin, interact.js. If you want to know more about it, check it out. Very easy to use. Next up, we have a blog post over on the Parse blog called Let the Browser Handle Your UI Logic For You. Now, what Sounds are they, reasonable. What do they mean by that? Well, sometimes when you're creating interactive elements, say a nice stylized checkbox here, it can be tempting to actually just use something like a div or some sort of non-semantic element, put some JavaScript on top, maybe an animation, and then it looks like this super cool checkbox. But that's not a very progressively enhanced way to think about things. And in fact, it's not a great use of browser technology that's already there for you. The browser already has checkboxes. So what they're saying is, why not just style those instead? Now, that's a pretty simple and obvious example, but what about when you have something like a calendar where you need to pick a date? There's not really a great or well-supported element that is equivalent to this type of UI widget. So what do you do? Well, each one of these days in their calendar is actually a radio button behind the scenes. So these are all just very nicely and cleverly styled radio buttons. It's a little bit more work to get this to function properly in all sorts of different web browsers that would need to use something like this, but it looks really nice and it's progressively enhanced, which is always good. Next up, there is a file tree here. So this is another example of something that's a little bit more complicated. But this file tree where you can click on a folder, open it up, and see its contents in the tree is actually not using any JavaScript at all, which I thought was pretty amazing. Instead, they just use some CSS selectors 
and check boxes. So they say if something is checked, well, then go ahead and show this other bit here. It's pretty cool, pretty clever way of thinking about how to use form elements to create these more complex UI widgets. And keep them accessible. Yeah, without, you know, pouring in a ton of JavaScript and non-semantic elements to do the same thing. Pretty smart. Yeah, very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a project called purplecoat.js. Uh, this is a pretty cool little piece of JavaScript that lets you create overlays on elements without using a single line of JavaScript. So what does that mean? If you check this button right here, it says, click me for a demo. I click that, and it says, hey, hello from Purple Coat. Click the button to hide this again. So it turns those particular divs into overlays. Now, there are some different options for this. If you want to use it, you can. here's an image right here on the left. And it has a data attribute for Purple Coat, and then an identifier, and then the label that you want it to have. So once you hit click me over here, that label goes into effect. And then we can see on the right side, we have the toggle with the same identifier that was used over on the left. Now, the example use case is a Jekyll blog theme that the author created. And she uses that to show you which parts are customizable. So when you click that button, the navigation, the post header, and the sidebar are all highlight highlighted as customizable. And you can create multiple triggers for odds and evens as an example, and you can even customize the color. Anyway, a uh, pretty cool little plugin, really quick. Go ahead and check that out, purplecoat.js. Next up is an SVG animation library thing called Walkway. It's an easy way to animate simple SVG elements. What do I mean by that? Well, there was this wonderful review over on Polygon a little while back. It's a game review site where they had this really cool SVG animation. So I'll show you a simple demo here. And this is actually Walkway doing all of this. So it can draw all of these lines and create objects, basically, that are done with SVGs. How does that work? Well, first, you need to actually install it. So you can use it via CDN and just include this JavaScript file. Or you can use your favorite package manager, whether that's Bower or Node. Then you just instantiate a walkway object in your JavaScript, and you pass it some options. So you can tell it things like which selector you want to use, how long the animation should actually last, and you can do a little bit of easing as well. And then you call the draw function, and you can do that wherever you might need to in your JavaScript logic. Maybe that's on page load, or maybe that's after the user has clicked a button. I don't know. It's up to you. And then it We're not here to tell you what to do. And then it will actually draw that SVG with those nice lines and stroke paths and everything that you saw there. Pretty cool stuff. I like that there's actually not a whole lot of options to configure. And you can just apply it to an SVG, and you are good to go. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a quick little blog post on native two-way binding in JavaScript. And this blog post goes over a couple of different ways to accomplish this using the brand new object.observe, which will be standard in ECMAScript 7, but is also in the latest versions of Chrome, and then another version that is widely supported. Now, this is going to be interesting if you want to go through and see how some of these different JavaScript libraries might implement this observation pattern. So, in the first example, it says, observe this object. And then for each change, well, we're going to be binding that to this user's full name attribute. But we can actually go ahead and extract that and then update a certain div while we do that exact observation. And then later, the author goes through and extracts that into a function and then go, goes ahead and makes it even more generic and puts an alert in there just for fun. Now, the other way to do that is changing the get and set methods. And this is done using object define property. So you can define a property on this user object right here each time get and set are called. 
then the different values are going to be get and set accordingly. Now, if you want to, you can go ahead and do this with a DOM element as well. So the author goes through and says, okay, as long as we are getting and setting these items, let's go ahead and update this DOM element's value. And then you can see later that as these are updated, it stays consistent each way. And then the author is also nice enough to give us a TLDR with that one function using define property, which has more support in different browsers. Anyway, I didn't do that justice. I really recommend reading the blog post to get a little bit more in depth with how you want to do that if this is something you're curious about. So curious about. It's always good to know how these things work under the hood. Definitely. Well, that's all we have time for this week. I am at NickRP on Twitter. And I am at JCypher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out our show notes right below this video. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll talk to you next week.